So, uh, as I said, we're going to talk to this morning. I'm going to introduce herb gardening in Northern Virginia and give an overview of, um, of how to grow herbs generally. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? And the next slide, please. So this is a beautiful picture that was taken uh, from Maryfield Gardens website showing how herbs can not only be edible, but also beautiful. Next slide, please. So why do we grow herbs? Well, um, mostly I think we grow them to eat them. Uh, they're easy to grow. They uh, add a wonderful dimension of smell fragrance and taste to our gardens. They're generally pest free. Uh, deer don't like them, so that's a big plus here in Northern Virginia. And they have lots of useful purposes. We, we use them for cooking uh, and crafts. Uh, and for ages, they've also been used uh, medicinally. And we can use them for fragrance too. So they're very useful. Next slide, please. So there's really two different definitions of herbs. There's a botanical definition. Uh, and then there's the one that we gardeners tend to use, which really expands the number of herbs uh, uh, in our lexicon. So the botanical definition of an herb is just a plant that dies back to the ground each year without forming a woody stem <laughs> tissue. But we gardeners uh, classify a lot of things as herbs that do have woody stem tissue, such as lavender, rosemary, and bay. And uh, I would say that a lot of the plants that we, uh, we um, call T perennial herbs uh, or tender perennial herbs uh, form woody stems. Uh, the next thing I'd like to uh, discuss is uh, the, that the um, lifespan of herbs. There are essentially, as with all um, uh, uh, herbal type plants, three uh, types. There's your annuals, there's your biennials and there's your perennials. And we're all very used to annual plants. Those are plants that perform their entire life cycle from seed to flower to seed within a single growing season. And I've put some pictures here of annual herbs that we're all familiar with, such as basil, cilantro, dill, fennel, marjoram, and sable. Uh, next slide, please. Then there are the biennial herbs. Uh, the, those are plants that have a two-year biological cycle. So the first year, the, the seeds produce a root structure and stems and leaves. Uh, often it's a rosette uh, that you see uh, close to the ground. And then the second year, the biennial plant forms flowers, fruits, and seeds and then it uh, usually dies. So here are some biennial herbs, the uh, angelica, caraway, watercress, and parsley. Now, the one that we're probably the most familiar with and that we're gonna be talking about uh, in more depth later is parsley. Now, parsley is often grown as an annual. So why would you, uh, if you have a, a biennial herb, would you grow it as an annual? Well, that's because uh, the second year parsley bolts to seed. And if you wanna use the, uh, the leaves, then you're gonna use it during its first year and treat it as an annual. Next slide, please. Perennial herbs um, are uh, uh, plants that die back to the ground each fall and usually when, in the first frost or freeze, although some uh, of these tougher ones can last a little bit longer. But the important thing about perennials is that their roots live through the winter and they regrow in the spring. Now, um, 
contrary to their name, uh, perennial plants aren't really perennial. They can last a very long time, but they don't normally last forever. Most plants have a useful lifespan. And so plants that you buy as perennials uh, often uh, only last from three to five years. So it's very important when you buy an herb that's classified as perennial to look at its characteristics and see um, the, its hardiness zone. And I'm going to talk about that a bit in the next slide, the concept of a tender perennial. Uh, Fairfax County, as we know, is considered to be zone 7A. And so the herbs that I've listed on this screen are considered true perennials in Fairfax County uh, because it rarely gets down below zero degrees here. And those are uh, plants like chives, lavender, mint, oregano, sage, and thyme. And next slide, please. So I wanna talk a little bit about tender perennials because uh, you can get very disappointed if you buy an herb that you think is a perennial, and that's called a perennial, and then it doesn't make it through the winter. Uh, so um, again, many plants that might be designated uh, as perennials are not going to survive the winter here. Uh, we're talking about plants like lemongrass uh, or often rosemary, for example. So if you do buy a tender perennial and you want it to survive, you're probably going to have to overwinter it. That means uh, taking it into the house, taking it into a garage, uh, taking it somewhere where it's not going to be exposed to really cold temperatures. And so you, you know, you essentially have to decide whether you have the space and whether you want to try to keep it alive over the winter or if you're just going to, you know, take the chance and let it die. We had a mild winter like this past winter, so um, some of the tender perennials made it through the winter, but um, this is something you're going to have to deal with. And I do grow uh, herbs like this, like I grow lemongrass and lemon verbena and uh, other herbs like that. And I uh, rosemary and I will take them inside during the winter. Uh, I'm sorry to say that I can't always keep them alive even in the house, but I figure it's, I have the room so it's worth a try. Next slide, please. Okay, well, uh, it looks like we might be having some technical difficulties uh, in terms of getting to the next slide. I'm so, not exactly sure what happened. There we are. Can you see those? I just see tender perennial. Okay. So, uh, there know. we go. Okay, thank you. I don't okay. know exactly what happened, but... <laughs> Easily fixed. It's a miracle of technology. Yes. Uh, uh, or the bedevilment. Um, take your <laughs> pick. Yeah. Uh, so uh, here's a few tidbits about growing herbs. Uh, first, remember that many of the herbs that we love, like lavender, for example, uh, are, are native to the Mediterranean, Northern Europe, or Asia and they, 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 while we can get them to grow here, they don't always thrive. Uh, lavender grows in a rocky soil, uh, in a, you know, a tight, uh, and can tolerate a lot of dryness. And many of us don't have those conditions, at least in our yards. So think about it. Think about uh, whether, whether you're going to actually be able to grow lavender. Another thing is it needs a lot of drainage. So um, one thing to uh, consider 
is growing herbs in, in containers where it's easier for you to mimic the condition, the natural conditions of these plants. I grow a lot of herbs uh, in containers and one of the reasons that I do that is because it keeps them very close and handy to my house and my, I can just run outside onto my deck and pick them while I'm cooking. Uh, and um, it also it makes it easy to contain them. And as I said, to uh, find optimum sun for them and things like that. Yeah, or growing herbs in containers is easy and um, that's not the subject of today, but it's certainly something to think about. Uh, most herbs do need six hours of sun daily, but um, I've listed a few that will tolerate or even prefer some partial shade. Uh, uh, and and there I've listed them on the slide. Um, so uh, dill, uh, parsley, uh, shiso, uh, sweet woodruff, chervil, some of those actually prefer some shade. Another thing you want to do is give your herb plants plenty of circulation, uh, plenty of space for air circulation. Uh, one of everyone's favorite herbs, basil, um, it has typically uh, because, uh, is very susceptible to downy mildew and um, uh, air circulation uh, helps to prevent that. If we have time, we can talk about uh, some of the wonderful new basil varieties that have been developed in the last few years that are resistant to downy mildew. It's been a real breakthrough in plant breeding. Uh, next slide, please. Most herbs prefer a soil pH of 6.3 to 7. Uh, good drainage is critical and um, uh, consider adding some organic matter to improve the soil or consider raised beds or containers. Uh, Overwatering is worse than underwatering when it comes to herbs. So often if we're in a period where we're getting sufficient rain, uh, you don't have to water at all. Uh, when it is dry or extremely hot, then uh, you would tend to water every four or five days. Uh, most herbs don't need a lot of fertilizer, and if you have good soil, they may not need any. Uh, if you are going to add uh, uh, fertilizer, consider a slow release one, and also consider uh, organic fertilizers because uh, you're going to be eating the herbs. Um, uh, finally, insects are rare, and again, because you're eating the herbs, if you, if you do feel like you need to uh, get rid of some insects, I have had some issues with thrips, for example, on my chives, uh, consider a strong spray of water or insecticidal soap um, because you're eating the plant and you don't want to use anything on it, that's really toxic. Next slide, please. Uh, well, that is the end of my presentation. And uh, here I've listed a number of resources that were used to help put together the program. Uh, these are all terrific resources and I recommend them to you. To move to our neighbor to neighbor chat and we're going to have some great presentations from uh, Gardner Ellen and Gardner Jamie. Uh, Gardner Ellen is going to talk about parsley, thyme, and pollinators and insects to expect. And Gardener Jamie is going to talk about dill, cilantro, and pollinators and insects to expect. So Gardener Ellen, can we hear some tips about growing parsley and thyme? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ellen. I'm a 2020 Master Garden intern from Green Spring Gardens. Um, today, I will be talking briefly about parsley and thyme and how to care for them. This here is a picture of some parsley and thyme that I put together in a little window box in my backyard just about a month ago. Next slide, please. 
Okay, I love gardening with herbs and parsley is one of my favorites. I was pleased to see and surprised to see that parsley was named the 2021 Herb of the Year by the International Herb Association. It is native to the Mediterranean area and it's a member of the uh, Apaceae or umbella fir or carrot family is much easier to say. Um, this herb is considered a cool season herbaceous biennial. And Elaine explained earlier what a biennial, biennial is. It lives for two years. The first year it forms dark green leaves with feather-like foliage and has a long tap root, which is used as food storage over the winter. The second year it forms a flower. The flowers set seed and the plants die the second year. Flowering can occur anywhere around June through August. And there are two main types of um, parsley, the curly or French leaf variety or the flat leafed or Italian parsley, otherwise known as Petro Selenium Crispum Neopolitanum. Okay, all portions of the plant are edible. This popular herb adds flavor to sauces, salads and soups. It can be used hot or cold and curly parsley is used more as a garnish. The flat leaved or the Italian variety has a richer, more robust flavor. It's also high in AC, iron and other nutrients. Next slide, please. Parsley prefers moist, well-drained soil rich in organic matter in full sun to light shade. The seeds are slow to germinate and I can attest to that. I planted seeds early in March during a warm spell, it was March 3rd, and they took three long weeks to emerge. It turns out you can soak the seeds in hot water for 24 hours to speed up the germination. So next time I will read the fine print. Um, <laughs> it's um, once the plants are big enough, you wanna space them about four to six inches apart. And you can harvest parsley when the plant reaches about eight inches in height. Um, you wanna cut from the outer stalk and you can keep the sprigs of parsley in the refrigerator and water before use. And once again, Elaine mentioned something about um, cleaning herbs. You wanna make sure they're um, rinsed and patted, pat dry before use. Um, parsley is best used fresh. Um, it has a clean and slight peppery flavor. You can freeze it for future use by placing it in ice cube trays or in little plastic Ziploc bags. It tends to lose flavor when left to dry. Besides the culinary usage of parsley, it attracts beneficial species of wildlife. The flowers attract bees, parasitoid wasps, hoverflies, and other nectar feeding insects. These insects in turn can help control aphids, thrips, white flies, and caterpillars, which can be a nuisance in the garden for vegetables or flowers. They are natural enemies of pests. The hoverflies um, prey on aphids that can attack the tomato plants. And this can be used as a trap plant, not with all varieties. So you, you wanna check on that. Parsley also attracts beneficial insects that prey on the cutworms and cabbage worms which prey on uh, brassicas like our um, broccoli and cabbage. Okay, next slide, please. Parsley is host to the parsley worm or black swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. The Eastern black swallowtail butterfly is the adult stage of the parsley worm caterpillar. The leaves are a favorite of this black and green striped caterpillar with yellow dots. They have a ferocious appetite and will feed for about two weeks before turning into butterflies. Because of that, it's best to plant extra parsley because of the damage. The black swallowtail butterfly is a valuable pollinator in the garden. Okay, um, that's just a brief um, summary of parsley. Are there any questions? And these are my references. Next. Okay, um, my next herb is thyme. Um, thyme is a herbaceous perennial. 
This small shrub-like evergreen can grow about a foot high and around 16 inches or so in width. Um, the leaves tend to be small and oval shaped. The colors vary from green to gray or variegated with white or yellow edges. The flowers are small and tubular, white to lavender in color. And the bloom time can vary roughly May to July into August. It's also Mediterranean in origin and it does best in full sun, well-drained, rocky or sandy soil. This herb is extremely low maintenance. Um, it's drought and deer resistant um, plant. What is not to love about this? Uh, the stems do get woody as they age. So it's best to cut back early each spring about four to five inches to promote new growth. And as you harvest the uh, thyme, that will also, you will encourage new growth. So I personally have had one pot of thyme for years on my back in my backyard and it totally thrives on neglect. I use it year round, um, I keep it out there and even through February, I did a lot of um, cooking, it, it survived the winter, which was great. So it's most often used where you need to add zest and flavor, it's good in soups, stews, sauces, meat dishes and fish dishes. Now this herb is also a member of the mint family, just keep that in mind. Um, the top picture there is some lemon thyme that I uh, bought and put in my little windowsill box. And the lower picture is common thyme in bloom. So thyme is also very beneficial for the pollinators. It attracts the bees, the wasps, the butterflies, and other beneficial insects, which in turn can control aphids, white flies, and other pests like the caterpillars. And this in turn can help the vegetable crops um, like tomatoes and um, eggplant. It's a real good biological control to use to plant around the vegetable garden. Okay, next slide. Okay, so uh, thyme can be grown in containers outside or even inside on a sunny windowsill. They can be used in rock gardens, borders, between stepping stones and used as ground covers. Uh, the picture to the right was taken approximately two weeks ago at, um, in Fairfax at Merrifield Garden Center. I believe this was lemon thyme that you can see. Um, it has spread nicely and it is a member of the mint family and you know, it could spread more than you like. So you may need to divide up your thyme if it's extremely happy if it's going places where you don't want it to go. So the foliage has ornamental value um, it keeps winter interest and it helps with erosion control. This other picture on the left is um, red creeping thyme. Um, it's also known as mother of thyme or thymus serpylum coxius. Excuse my pronunciation. Um, so, and that is a brief summary of thyme and parsley and any questions? Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, next slide. Uh, I am an intern at the Fairfax County Master Gardeners, and I hope to be finished at the end of this year. Um, so um, I want to talk about dill and uh, dill and cilantro, which I'm going to talk about in a little while, are in the same family as parsley. So they're her, a herbaceous annual plant. Uh, their origin is from the Eastern Mediterranean and Western Asia. They're in the same family, the A. PACI or umbel, umbelliferae, and um, they're a family of aromatic uh, flowering plants, um, and uh, they're in the same family with carrots and celery and chervil and, and cilantro. So they have many culinary uses. Um, uh, they're uh, used uh, in um, cooking in Europe and uh, the Mediterranean area. And um, I just listed a few um, uh, varieties that are recommended uh, and these give their characteristics. Some are compact um, and some of them are, um, um, the varieties are developed so they won't bolt. They'll be more resistant to bolting, which is a problem with both dill and, um, and cilantro. So these are just a few. So next slide, please. 
So if you're going to grow dill, um, it's better to uh, to plant them very shallowly and uh, and in a sunny area after the last frost. You want your soil to be around 60 to 70 degrees and uh, hopefully they'll germinate within 10 to 14 days. Uh, I don't know if they'll have the same problem that Ellen's parsley did, but possibly. And then what you want to do is when they come up and if you you want to thin them out so that you have a plant about every 12 to 18 inches apart. Uh, for the leaves, the growing season is about 70 days and for the seeds, it's 90. And if you want to have dill all season long, what you should do is stagger your planting. And so plant your seeds in two to three week successions so that you'll have some nice dill uh, throughout the season. You also want to harvest the leaves when the plant has say four to five leaves on it and you want to take the oldest ones first and you can extend your leaf harvest if you can pinch, you pinch off the flowers and delay the flowers from forming and the plant continues then to not put its energy into making flowers but into the leaves. And then it will eventually uh, turn to seed and uh, you uh, want to collect those seeds when they, uh, before they change color, they change sort of tan or brown. And then you just store those uh, to plant next year. Next slide. So um, dill is also one of the host plants for the swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. So you can call it a pest and people who are want to help the butterflies, you just plant extra for them so that you have some for them to eat. Um, the, um, because uh, the butterfly will lay its eggs on the dill and then when the caterpillars come out of the egg, uh, they will eat, eat the dill. Mm -hmm. and, um, there are other ones that are other uh, pests that are more prob you know more of a problem uh, that and there's very similar to parsley. There's aphids and these army worms. There's also cutworms which are in the ground and they come out at night. And then less common are uh, grasshoppers, slugs, snails, and this tomato hornworms, which I think was mentioned before. They have lots of pollinators that, and beneficial uh, insects that, that uh, you want to attract to your garden uh, because these are beneficial, as, was, as uh, um, Ellen said, these beneficial insects will help uh, save all those nasty bugs that are eating your vegetables and things. And so uh, honeybees are attracted to them, butterflies, ladybugs, hoverflies, crane mantises, and the parasitic wasps. And um, um, as with parsley, uh, as Ellen talked about, if you plant dill among your brassica uh, plants in your garden, it'll help deter some of these cabbage lopers, worms, and moths, and even spider mites. Um, next slide. Okay, so this is a list of uh, I, I, I always over-research, so I apologize <laughs> so you can look through them. Some of them are very short, but some of them were very interesting, I thought. Um, some about companion, uh, companion plants for dill, and, uh, and, uh, and the one article that may go to similar, that could address the topic that was raised earlier is this one called Grow Journey. It's about the fifth one down. And it lists a lot of pollinators. So that might, if you're, if you're very interested in just looking broadly at all herbs, that might be a good one to look at. Okay, next slide. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about um, cilantro. Jamie, before we go to cilantro, we do have one question in okay. the chat about dill. Um, I've not yet gotten dill to grow from seed. Is there a trick to this? Well, I haven't gotten it to grow from seed either. I usually buy plants at a nursery. I haven't tried it, but it, doing all this research, it made me want to try it. Uh, the, the seeds are very tiny too, aren't they? Little tiny black things, or am I wrong? Um, Jamie, I have actually have some dill plants growing and I've had really good luck. They're about an inch and a half high. 
Okay. I will definitely give you some. It, All right. it germinated quickly, quickly. I did this indoors, not outside. Yeah, I, um, I think that you always have to be careful if you're transplanting them, anything that you do, these young plants that you grow from seed yourself, you have to just be very delicate when you finally do transplant them to a larger container. And so maybe growing them in these peat pots and there's these all these new things that are out there that you don't actually even have to take it out. You just take the whole whole little pot and you stick it in a bigger pot and then it'll disintegrate. So so thanks, Ellen, for yeah. being in there. And I will take you up on that. That's great. I have it set aside. OK, so I'm going to talk about cilantro. And we're probably the only country in the world that calls it cilantro. The rest of the world seems to call it, call it coriander. And um, we look at it. Uh, mo and so the leaves are considered to be cilantro, which is actually the Spanish name for cor coriander. And the seeds are considered to be the, the, uh, our coriander, which we grind and spice, and you know, we get the spice and we cook with it. So it originally came from Southern Europe, uh, North Africa, and Western Asia. And uh, some tidbit that I found out that maybe will be a question on Jeopardy is um, the seeds, evidence of coriander seeds were found in King Tut's tomb. So I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, so it's, it was, so the Egyptians used it 3000 years ago. And so it's been around for a long time. So it's a herbaceous annual plant. It self seeds like dill. And I talked to you a little bit about the difference between, you know, versus cilantro versus. So if you see it, if you're out of the country somewhere and you see it, they'll be calling it coriander. It's also in the fam same family and of course, it has many culinary uses and, um, you know, you wouldn't find a curry without it. It's used in Indian cooking, Asian cooking, um, Middle Eastern. It's a very popular uh, uh, spice to use in that cooking. Um, some of some recommended uh, varieties are here. Um, I've listed them, but there are many. If you want to do your research, I think you have to know what you're looking for. Some of them are high yield. And uh, one trait that some of them sh try to go for is that it's slow to or resistant to bolting. So that you would find too, but some, and some are more heat tolerant um, and they're quick to grow and the flavor. Okay, next slide. Okay, so cilantro is, again, you plant it shallowly, you plant it in a sunny area, but it doesn't like as much sun as dill. It likes some afternoon shade. And uh, you plant it, of course, after the last frost. The leaves uh, have a 45 to 80 day growing season. For the seeds, it's about 100 days. You want to thin them out also after they germinate so that they're about 12 months apart. And um, you, um, and in, in, as with dill, you would want to, if you wanted to have cilantro all season, you would want to plant it successively every two to three weeks, plant new seeds, get new plants so that you have cilantro. cilantro. Although mo many of the things I read said you should really only try to grow it in the spring and the fall mm -hmm. and that it doesn't really like the summer heat. So if you do decide to keep it, you probably should put it in a cooler location. You harvest the leaves when the plant is at least six inches tall. Again, oldest leaves first, and you can pinch the flowers off to um, their sort of white, pink colored umbral shapes, like an umbrella uh, shaped flower. And if you pinch them off, you'll get more leaves. Um, you uh, collect the pods, uh, same as with dill, and maybe after two or three weeks after bloom, when they turn a light brown color and then you dry to store. And something that I didn't realize is that there are pods, which you see in this picture here, uh, the photos, and actually the seeds are inside these pods. So I didn't know that, <laughs> or at least I, you know, I, I don't know, but I was trying to think, oh, what did, my, what did my cilantro look like? But you rub them together and that releases the seeds. So I'm gonna have to try that. Okay. 
Next slide. Ah. <laughs> so this is very similar to, uh, to dill. Uh, this, uh, you also find the swallowtail butterfly caterpillar on these and aphids and the cabbage lopers and also uh, cutworms. And these, uh, once they flower, attract, you know, the beneficial insects. These, uh, you'll get tiny native bees and insects. You also get hoverflies, lace wings. Uh, here you get the, the cyphered uh, flies, the, which look like a tiny bee, and also parasitic wasps. And the next slide is a list of some of my references. It's also called Mexican parsley. I noticed that, I mean, I've heard it called Chinese parsley and, and also Mexican parsley. It has several names. And it doesn't taste anything like parsley, <laughs> but it looks a little like parsley. Uh, I wanted to uh, chime in on the growing dill from seed question. Uh, I have had some luck letting dill go to seed in my containers and then having it germinate uh, the, next, the next spring on its own. Um, so, so that's one thing to try. Uh, they, it, uh, the uh, resources also say that dill, uh, like Jamie said, dill is notoriously difficult to transplant. So they really do recommend sowing the seed where you're gonna grow, grow the dill. Um, uh, uh, Elaine, I think it's because it has a long tap root. Mm. Cilantro does too, and it's in the carrot family. So when you think about that, that's a big type tap root. But uh, apparently, that's one of the reasons that it's difficult to transplant. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, and, and another thing about dill and cilantro, I think that in one of the slides, uh, one of my slides, where I was talking about plants that you can grow in shade or partial shade, that dill and cilantro are both uh, uh, in that family. And I think that by putting them in some shade, uh, it will slow down their tendency to bolt mm -hmm. or go to seed. Mm -hmm. 